London is doomed, said Dr. Goebbels. And Adolf Hitler's intuitive propaganda experts claimed that in its first few days of attack last June, V-1, the flying bomb, the robot bomb, the buzz bomb, had almost entirely removed the city of London from the war-scarred face of the earth. Yes, once again, the great, patient, enduring city of London was suffering. Find yourself as V-1 might have found you, coming at you from dawn to dusk, dusk to dawn. You're a passenger on a crosstown bus. This is the end of your last ride. You're a kid in school. This is your lesson for today. You're an airman on leave, and this is your welcome mat. You're a diner in a restaurant. This is where you have your last bite. You're a patient in a hospital. This is your final treatment. You're a worshiper in church. This is where you kneeled and never got up again. Yes, London was suffering under V1. Suffering, but alive. 23,000 buildings utterly destroyed. One million damaged. Over 5,000 lives lost. Over 16,000 broken. But London worked. You're a member of a heavy rescue squad and you dig with your hands to save a life. You're an attendant in a first aid station and you haven't slept in three days. You're a G.I. M.P. and you break patrol to help the London Bobby. You're the man on the street and you do what you can. London suffered, but London worked and London fought. steel cable stretched in the sky. You're a pilot of a Tempest or Mustang or new type Spitfire sweeping through space. And you bring down nearly 2,000 pilotless bombs in the 80 days. And it isn't easy. Yes, you fight back and you bring them down in the thousands. But some get through to the villages and towns of England and some get through to London. Their numbers are also in the thousands. They come groaning and spitting and roaring and you don't know when they'll suddenly stop and drop on you. You're a farm laborer. It's like sitting in a dentist's chair when they come over. Only worse. They're a hairdresser in for a swim on Sunday afternoon. It's like seeing snakes. You don't like snakes worse. You're a citizen of southern England and it's a matter of life and death. Your life, your death. You're a roof spotter or any kind of spotter. And all you can do is watch out for them and pray. The Germans had hoped to win a compromise peace out of the bombardment of London. They had hoped that the new trial of the battered capital would finally break the will of the English people. 
They broke British homes, churches, schools, bodies. But the will to fight grew stronger than ever. On a bright Sunday morning in June, a buzz bomb hit the chapel near the London barracks of a famous regiment of the British Army. In that chapel were wives and children of the men who were fighting that morning outside Khan. After that, those men fought with merciless ferocity. The Germans in Normandy paid for the blind savagery of their masters. The British have not been the only ones to suffer under the new weapons in the Nazi arsenal. Americans were killed by the side of their allies. American wax, serving in London, died on this new random battlefield. And later on the continent, the Germans gave us a preview of the wars of the future by assailing us in Luxembourg and Belgium with a sputtering robot bomb. Imagine the wars of the future. Look at this wreckage and see New York in the next war. Washington, San Francisco, Milwaukee, Dallas. Imagine the far-reaching weapons of 1960, 1970. Continents would war against continents across great oceans. Buttons would be pressed, the cities would crumble half a world away. It would be a war of wizards. No one anywhere would be out of the front lines. Your children would be on the edge of a perpetual Senlo, a constant Tarawa. That is, if you don't stop it. You have bled for the people of London, and they have bled for you. That goes for the people of Stalingrad, the people of Manila, the people of Athens, Paris, and Chungking. If you remember that, if you remember that you don't want that bleeding for yourselves and for them to continue forever, if you remember that you want a peace that no monstrous inventions, no violent men can ever destroy, if you remember all that, and devote yourself to it as you're devoting yourself to winning this war, your children and your children's children will never stand like this on American soil, looking up at the rubble of their homes. USA, the greatest entertainers in America, as requested by you, the service men and women of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Introducing your master of ceremonies for this session is kind of a tough job because, well, he's such a stranger to command performance. In fact, he hasn't been on the show since an hour before he left for the South Pacific. It's Bob Hope. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob. That wasn't my scotch that fell out of the plane, Hope. <laughs> but I really had a wonderful trip. Wherever I went, the soldiers toasted me, and now I'm back. A guy can stand getting hot foot for just so long, you know. <laughs> you know, the weather down there is like it is here. Of course, they have a light sprinkle now and then. A light sprinkle, that's South Pacific. For man the boats, boys, the island disappeared again. <laughs> But I was glad to get back and see that Hollywood hasn't changed much. much. Slacks are still the rage. You can see everything in slacks, except slack. And I, uh, <laughs> and I understand that Crosby just went to England. Isn't that silly? I thought London had all the fog it needed. <laughs> you know why Crosby went over, of course. The Army finally decided to have some entertainment for the older servicemen. <laughs> thought they'd send Sinatra's dad over, but I, uh, I just heard from the old groaner, and he's a little worried. It seems he heard a rumor that the Germans have invented a jet-propelled stork. <laughs> but you know, one of the most heartening facts I picked up on my G.I. jaunt was that two of my favorite gals here in Hollywood are fast becoming your favorite overseas. A lot of you guys who have seen two girls in the sailor have written us requesting the Mrs. June Allison and Gloria De Havens. <laughs>
Beautiful? I want to tell, ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like you to meet a member of our troupe that has just returned from the South Pacific, a man who's been all over, a famous world traveler, Professor Kelowna, right here. Well, there he is. Say, Professor, we'd like a few words on your experience as a world traveler. That Pacific tour wasn't your first big trip, was it, Kelowna? Oh, no, I've been to England, Russia, Australia, Africa, and Alaska. You've been to England, Russia, Australia, Africa, and Alaska. Yes. I'll get one of your checks cashed yet. <laughs> Well, Professor, you certainly are living proof that man is only a few steps ahead of monkey. Well, walk fast. I'll wait for you. <laughs> I don't know if I told you this or not, Hope, but I'm planning another big trip. You see, I'm going to visit the icebox, the oven, and the pantry. Icebox, oven, and pantry? What kind of a big trip is that? Cook's tour. <laughs> You know, Kelowna, one thing puzzled me on our trip. You never worried about us coming down in the ocean. There's an awful lot of water out there, you know. Oh, I don't worry about that, Hope. I can hold my breath for three hours. You can hold your breath for three hours? That's ridiculous. Oh, it is, eh? Yes, it is. Nobody can hold his breath for three hours. Well, watch. I'll prove it to you right now. Say, fellas, while the professor's holding his breath, I'd like to say something that I think is pretty important. When the Army decides to bust you back to civilian life, you're going to need and want a lot of things that cost money. You won't be able to get by like Kelowna does just by holding your breath. No, the new clothes you'll want to start in business, getting married. Incidentally, the professor's getting red in the face. Well, there are things to start saving for now. A good deal is GI bonds or soldiers' deposits. So think it over. Save a little each payday. Professor, how are you doing? <laughs> Where does a guy go for a retread? <laughs> Fellas, here's some really supernatural digit manipulating that ought to leave you swinging from the closest cloud by your thumbs. You'll probably catch her in the MGM Sensation Bathing Beauty. It seems that this young lady toured the South American continent, discovered and brought back with a little song called Tico Tico. English translation, when the bees start making honey, I'll come home and have the hives with you. <laughs> Regardless, I want you to meet one of the most talented artists ever to appear in command performance, assisted by the AFRS Orchestra, Miss Ethel Smith. A talent for just plain Smith, you know. <laughs> but then it's always a pleasure to introduce your next guest, a lovely young lady who spent so much time with you GIs all over the world. She's practically standard equipment, one of your all-time favorites, Frances Langford. Embrace me, my sweet embrace of you. you 
tipsy in me. You and you alone bring all the gypsy in me. I love all the many charms about you. Looks like that does it for this session. And speaking for the gang with us tonight, and for all the guys and gals who come down here to command performance every week, I want you to know we consider it a privilege to knock out these programs and try to make life just a little brighter for you. I've talked to lots of you guys in the field, and I gather that the Armed Forces radio shows mean a lot to you. Believe me, they mean a lot to us performers, too. So just keep your requests coming by letter, postcard, V-mail, or put a note in a bottle and drop it overboard. We'll get it somehow and shoot your requests right back. If you haven't got time to write, stick your thumbprint on a friend's letter so we'll know you're all thinking of us, will you? Good night, gang.